Hi, everyone, and welcome to the live AMA pod, uh, podcast with Bitrix Global. My name is Rawa Berkey, and I'm the Vice President of Operations at Bitrix Global, and I will be your host for today's AMA. Joining us, we're really excited to have the CEO and co-founder of Insights Network, Brian Gallagher, but he'll be answering questions from the Bitrix Global and greater crypto community regarding his company, Insight Network, and their token, Instar, which was recently listed on the Bitrix Global Exchange. So, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the intro, Rawa. I'm excited to be here and uh, really appreciate all the questions that the Bittrex Global community submitted for this. Looking forward to answering them. Um, it's uh, the third year of the project now, so uh, we're excited to be listing on Bittrex Global. The past three years have really just been a lot of uh, technical development and deploying our uh, delegated proof of stake blockchain, the premier application that we've built ourselves that is on top of the blockchain called instars.com. Um, and now starting to, you know, uh, expand the ability to, you know, purchase the token. So excited to uh, talk more about that. Absolutely. So let's kick it off with an easy question first. Can you tell us a little bit about Insight Network and the Instar token? Absolutely. So Insights Network started um, in, you know, late 2016, early 2017. Um, our existing business is what led into this project. Um, so we were, you know, we started our business in the, the traditional legacy data industry. And we were collecting uh, consumer receipts and um, the consumers would submit short surveys attached to their receipts, particularly in the fast food industry. So McDonald's, Burger King, we were collecting a lot of consumer data and in-store experience feedback. Um, and, you know, the business started, we were, we really thought the business model was going to um, be more about just getting brands to advertise, you know, go to our store, submit your receipts and give us feedback. But as the number of receipts we were collecting grew, we started to attend the trade shows and get to know different people in the industry. And what we discovered is that there's a much bigger data industry behind uh, what we were doing. And, uh, you know, data brokers would just want our receipts. You know, they, they didn't have to be the brand wanting to see their own user feedback and their own customer feedback. There's actually an entire middleman sort of quiet unknown industry that can take those receipts and then mix it into these huge data pools that have uh, so much information on every individual. Mm -hmm. So companies such as Axiom uh, may have up to 1,500 data points on us individuals. So with the GDPR being crafted, this was about 2016, uh, we realized that this is, you know, holy cow, like I, we didn't realize that, you know, there was this whole industry that's collecting so much data, even people's fast food eating habits, um, and, then a, and then keeping sort of a database on you and myself. Um, and it was just kind of uh, eye-opening. And we realized like one, this isn't going to fly anymore with all the different hacks that keep happening. You know, the Sony hack was the most recent one, I believe at that time. And Facebook was coming under scrutiny for all of the data they were collecting. And then also we were paying people you know, with PayPal, just uh, PayPal rewards, mostly limited US market only. And so that was another sort of looking at, you know, this business in 10 years, you know, how can we, touch a bigger portion of the world if we're limited to these payment processors. And so cryptocurrency started to be a thought. Um, and so we sort of reevaluated the business and said, Hey, why are we, why are we going to be trying to play in a legacy industry that we can see is about to hit a brick wall in the next few years and become you know, more regulated, more scrutiny. Uh, and then, you know, with the rise of blockchain and cryptocurrency, there's certain aspects to that technology that allows us to um, pay anyone anywhere in the world. So we don't need to just sit on the U S market, which is the biggest market. It's great. 
But if I can get the Brazilian market submitting all of their data and the Philippine market and even India, I'm unlocking, you know, new territories into an industry that's, you know, growing every year. And everyone's sort of trying to compete in just the U.S. or the U.K., but there's you know a billion people in India. So um, cryptocurrency was the answer in terms of how can we give value to these people who are providing value to us. And so we sort of you know we were early crypto guys. We've known about cryptocurrency. We had a bunch of altcoins when the the boom was happening, and so we decided to move our whole business onto blockchain. So we did a spec and then, you know, assigned each portion of our technology to how would this work better on blockchain? How would it be GDPR compliance, assuming that the legislation will pass and then we'll come to the U.S. market and have some new legislation here. And, um, you know, that's how we just did a full transition on the blockchain. And, you know, I'm happy to sort of I know there's a few questions that are about know how what are the features of our tech so now that you sort of understand the transition and background i'll be able to talk about the individual pieces of insights network and how the blockchain works to address sort of each of those issues absolutely great thanks so much for that origin story it's really fascinating to listen to how different companies are incorporating blockchain um, as a you know real life utility use case um, from their traditional alternative markets right so in regards to data yeah. hardware um, blockchain, of course, is a huge market for that. So that's super cool. Um, consider you, I know you guys have been around for about three years and recently transitioned into um, creating the Instar token. Of all the exchanges out there, why did you guys specifically choose Bitrix Global to list your Instar token? So I spoke with Chris probably about six months ago. Um, and he's, uh, you know, a big uh, part of the team over at Bitrex Global for anyone who doesn't know him. But um, we sort of talked about, you know, what the strategy that Bitrex Global was doing. And basically, you know, they, you established in Liechtenstein and, you know, you have good standing with the government there and a clear sort of roadmap to um, being allowed, I guess you would say is the word, to work with innovative new blockchain projects to really help spread the awareness and ability and access to these projects. Whereas, you know, a lot of other exchanges, especially in the more regulated markets, you know, they're so hamstrung and unable to, you know, work with newer projects just because of, you know, the uncertain regulatory uh, environment. And so you Bitrex Global really has it together, I guess would be the right word. You're very, it's very organized and it's all about promoting the new technology and the new projects. And so that really appealed to us. And we said, let's, let's go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. You hit it right on, on the, on the head with that. We really pride ourselves on compliance and supporting the most innovative projects in the blockchain space. So really excited that you guys sought us out and to be able to support your project on our platform. Yeah, we, we really appreciate that. It's, it's been great. Cool. So we got lots of questions from our community um, about the Insight Network and then Instar the token. So I don't want to keep our community waiting too long. Um, the first question we had come in was, in the crypto industry, there are innovative projects joining the blockchain space rapidly. How does Instar intend to compete and remain relevant? Good question. So it's all about um, for us really having a business model. And so we sort of had one going into the project. So we're not necessarily in business model discovery mode. And, you know, being able to get receipt data from users is very valuable. And that's a revenue driver that can keep us, you know, um, afloat, I guess would be the word. So the key, in my opinion, to a lot of blockchain projects is can you support the project on your own uh, without access to more fundraising? And, uh, you know, as founders, you're always sort of fundraising for your next round, um, but you need to uh, establish a, a foundation and a business model where you'll be able to support yourself, in, you know, in times of turmoil. And so I had noticed another question that was similar when I was looking through the um, sheets and, it was, you know, it's been a brutal bear market for a few years. So how did you survive and keep building? And so the answer is pretty simple. We've just been able to 
um, have a foundation where we can support ourselves and don't need anything else at this time. Uh, and that allows us to continue development. So I think that's reflected uh, pretty well if you just pay attention to the technology we've released. So we've released our entire blockchain. We have a network of our own block producers in our, from our own community. Uh, some of them are really well-known name, known names in the EOS block producer community. Um, so the network is secure in that regard. Uh, we built several data exchange smart contracts that are on our blockchain. So, you know, it's already live, deployed, and being used. Uh, and then we also have been able to build the application, which is more of the business side of things. It's more the business model. Um, and so that keeps us uh, with a foundation to grow, you know, to grow a consumer platform. You know, if we can continue to do that successfully, we'll be able to support ourselves and, you know, we will be able to raise more funding uh, when, the, when the time is right. Um, so one of the cool benefits of, of us sort of being able to sustain ourselves is we are able to continue producing new tech that's beyond our white paper. So we've already built more than the white paper. You know, we were supposed to be just a, more of like a second layer to the ES main network, but then we decided to just build our own chain uh, to better suit the needs of our users. The costs for an account are much lower than if you were to use a public net, uh, such as EOS. Um, and uh, one thing that's coming out next is uh, these data oracles. So the oracles are um, basically a key split uh, using some really advanced key splitting technology that has been developed over the last uh, 10 years by one of our partners. And uh, it's going to be an extremely secure oracle that can hold data in a secret state. So if someone's submitting their ID data or their survey data, uh, it will sit in this oracle, which is being managed by a decentralized network of resource providers. So it's not managed by one encryption key on some company's server. And you'll be able to have the data very secure in there and only output what is uh, you know, supposed to be seen. Um, and so on the data exchange side of things, we're just way ahead of the competition and on, on the blockchain side, at least, because we have all of the components live and working. Um, but we're gonna repurpose that Oracle to fit um, some of the current needs and desires of the market in the DeFi space. So I'll talk about that a little bit too. I think there's another question that was similar. Yes, you touched upon um, a few of the points for the next question, but I'll go ahead and state it and then you can um, respond so you're not reiterating. Okay. Sure. So the next question is, among technological key points such as decentralized applications, DeFi, and BPOS blockchain, how far is Instar going in each aspect at the moment? What is the main focus in terms of technological development? So I think on the blockchain side, we have staking rewards already built in live. So if you do have Instar tokens, you can stake them and you can vote for block producers and you're receiving a, a, a token reward of, I believe it's 3.23% in the first year. And then that number is pre-programmed into the smart contract to shrink by 50% each year. So there's an incentive to, in the early days of the network, stake and hold. Um, and then over time, the, uh, I guess, inflation on the currency will be decreasing by 50% per year. Uh, so that's done. Uh, the smart contracts or data exchange are done in live. Um, DeFi. DeFi is the new thing. Everyone's excited about it. Uh, we're not in the DeFi space, but we're actually doing something to contribute to DeFi. And so that has to do with the data oracles. As I mentioned, the oracles can be used to keep data in a secure environment so that can't be hacked. Uh, and we're able to filter through the data using uh, some secure multi-party computation software that our partners have deployed and output whatever we want to see from within the data. But that Oracle can be repurposed to custody assets as well. And so what we're going to do, and that's going to be launching in the next month or two, is we're going to open that Oracle so that anyone can, who is not on the Ethereum main network, will be able to... Uh, stake in star tokens to the Oracle, receive the rewards that's already built into the blockchain, and then they'll be able to transfer 
their tokens to and from the Ethereum main network so that they can access Uniswap where all the DeFi is happening. So basically we're deploying a bridge to Uniswap so that any token that's not on Ethereum can stake in star tokens, have access to the Oracle, which is being managed by a decentralized network of, uh, of sort of block producers. And uh, then they'll have access to the Uniswap uh, DeFi marketplaces. So um, we're not gonna be you know, issuing a new coin or anything like that. The Instar token will facilitate that process, but it's a really cool new feature and uh, utility that's coming to our token in the near future. Okay, great, thank you for that. And then earlier you touched upon how your company was founded off of data concerns um, that became pretty across the board. So you mentioned Sony, you also mentioned Facebook. And so another user submitted a question stating that, you know, dealing with data is risky, sensitive, and it requires trust. And with the increase in large technological companies selling or leaking their customers' data, how does Instar really fit in this equation? How do you guys ensure that that there's security, privacy, and confidentiality towards user data. Yeah, so it's a sort of step-by-step -step process for the user journey into Instars. And it starts with them uploading their ID and getting account verified. And then there's third-party checkers uh, who can check that. And when they approve an account, that, that file uh, disappears. So it's kind of like when you receive a Snapchat, you see it, it's checked, verified, and then it's, it's gone. But when you assign it to the blockchain account, those credentials then uh, are programmed into each account so that the smart contracts can determine eligible matches for data exchange. So when someone's building a request for data on our requester dashboard, uh, they're able to set demographic and, you know, um, uh, the demographic details that they want for their exchange. And then only the verified accounts with the right credentials are able to access that smart contract that they funded with tokens. So um, that's step one is, you know, account that has credentials, which is an entire identity layer that we've built and has a ton of other use cases that could come out of that. Um, then when you go into the data exchange, let's say you take a survey or submit receipt data, you uh, receive your token after that data passes in a direct connection to the data buyer. So we use a one-time pad encryption scheme that we built. So when you're submitting that data, it's transferred directly to the purchaser and you're the only two who have that data. So we don't, in terms of risk, we don't house all of the user data. We actually create direct connections between the buyer and the seller. Got it. Um, and then let's see, what, what, what was the last part of the question? There's one last thing I'm missing here. Um, yes. And then, uh, we also have a hybrid solution in terms of, uh, originally when we built this, you know, we went full on decentralized data where we never had anything, you know, so some users could, um, create their demographic profile values and it would actually save on their device. So it wouldn't ever even go to any type of server. So we've sort of mixed in a hybrid solution to make it a bit easier for user experience because most people aren't ready to manage their own data on their own device. But that's built so that when the market does go in that direction over the next 10 years, that's how everything's going to work is that there won't be any, any central storage anymore. Everything will be programmed onto your device and fully encrypted. And then those direct connections uh, between a buyer and a seller will always be there. And every user will always have the choice to give their data in an exchange for the tokens. So I think Facebook may actually end up adopting this in 10 to 20 years, over the next 10 to 20 years. But like, to simplify this, the way it will work is the user will always, and blockchain is so key for this because everything you can see what's happening on the blockchain. So on our blockchain, anytime there's a, what's called a match, you see it on the blockchain. So if someone made a data request or wants to see a user's data, they actually put it into the blockchain and then there's what's called matches and they all show up. So if you have an account, you can see if you were having matches. So it's a way to sort of 
publicly audit database management because someone can uh, see, oh, well, people are keep trying to see my data, you know, or my data keeps continually trying to be accessed. And you'll actually see if, if there was an exchange. So if a user data did pass through the network, it's the user would know if it happened without the permission by just querying the blockchain. Okay. So we think we think in the long run, you know, Facebook or the competitors who are up and coming like us, you know, that's the disruption is it puts the user back in control where they know if their things are trying to be accessed or used. Hey, what, what was your Spotify, you know, browser history this month? And you can literally just one click and sell it. Mm -hmm. So that's how we see the data network going into the future is all of the users will be, you know, empowered and in control and aware of what's happening. Whereas with the axioms and traditional legacy systems, it's the complete opposite. Data goes into server, it gets farmed a million times. It, the money's being made elsewhere. The user has no idea. You know, so that's, um, I hope I was able to give a good enough description of the difference between why blockchain and you know, how the user does maintain actual control. Because you hear the terminology thrown around a lot, but uh, you don't hear many good explanations. Absolutely. No, I, I think that was a fantastic explanation and, and really um, clear regarding the, the use case and really solving that asymmetric component with, um, you know, legacy companies only benefiting from the data, right? And not passing on any of those benefits onto the users. So makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, so next two questions are about the sustainability of um, the Instar token ecosystem. So the first one is, what are the ways that Instar generates profits and revenue to maintain your project? And what exactly is its revenue model? And how does it benefit different stakeholders of the Instar ecosystem? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, one thing about having a token uh, that really helps a two-sided marketplace, which is essentially what instars.com is, is that you can sort of solve the chicken and egg problem uh, yourself because you can become the requ mainline requester, right? So um, the marketplace doesn't have to sit and wait for a bunch of data purchasers to come and start using it. We're actually able to, as I mentioned earlier, collect receipts from users and surveys, you know, get them in bulk. And then uh, the way we built the system is there's no ID, you know, no personal ID attached to anything that a, a user is submitting. So when, you're a requester on Insights Network and you do pull data out, you may get the, so you'll get maybe the McDonald's receipt, um, but then it'll just say the general details of age, you know, gender. And anytime a user is submitting that, there's, it, it, it's saying, hey, do you agree to submit your gender answer, age, and country of origin in exchange for this many tokens, right? And so then there's that consensual data exchange where there's a record of that on the blockchain. Um, which once the exchanges are completed. So we're able to source a lot of receipts. The pandemic actually really took us for a, a curveball because that was our fastest growing um, sort of good, I guess, that we were uh, receiving and then um, packaging. Uh, and, you know, trends analysis. Um, the way that industry works is it's mostly used for attri uh, attribution. So data analytics companies will uh, work with big clients to say, hey, look at all the activity in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, there's you know, all these people going to McDonald's around these times. And then that, these are off, this is offline data because people are going and paying in cash, you know, or maybe gift cards and it's not registering back to these companies. So they're able to mix this offline data into their online data and then tweak their digital ad campaigns to support their, their clients' goals. Um, so that's the business that we're in on the receipt side. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's surveys and surveys is an absolutely huge industry. Um, and you know, every time someone completes a survey, if a client is funding it, then that's you know, revenue and the user is getting a, a, a piece of the revenue. Um, so the two main lines of business we're in are just receipts and then surveys and they kind of go together. Um, but we do not farm out user analytics or anything like that um, outside of what a user consensually exchanges. So the longevity of the project is going to come down to those two lines of business right now. Uh, something I just had a discussion with the other day 
uh, with the VC about though was um, the token also works really well in front loading user acquisition. So, you know, referral campaigns that where you win tokens, you know, staking rewards, keeps the community more tight knit and also gets a lot of um, user acquisition just because they want to be a part of a token community. So another cool thing for us is just having a crypto first consumer platform where a lot of eyeballs are coming every day. And the business model that comes with that is not necessarily always about receipts or surveys, but it's about what other crypto service offerings can we roll out to a crypto consumer audience. So there's some plans to roll out additional services that will also have revenue models. Um, so it's a bit of a domino effect, you know, as, as more eyeballs are coming, there's more revenue opportunities outside of just the data business as well. We're in the crypto currency industry. So there's a whole entire consumer, uh, you know, valuable consumer market there. Absolutely. So you stated that when a, a user fills out a survey, they get a split in the revenue. Like what, what's the ratios for that? It's really, so the way the Insights Network is built is it's actually, um, you know, it's up to the requester to set their own pricing model. So anyone can come create a survey and offer any size reward they want. And so. Getting, so I can't say that there's necessarily a you know, every survey could be different. You know, someone sometimes will pay like $5 a survey. Um, and then, you know, whatever the user or whatever they can extract value-wise beyond that is really up to them. So, you know, the idea is that's a decentralized marketplace with a, a pricing, like a flexible pricing economy. So over time, as there's more volume and that, that pricing model should find some type of equilibrium. I can tell you in general, though, in the, uh, survey industry, um, you know, maybe like a U.S. Uh, millennial would net three dollars and fifty cents for a survey complete. You know, something someone in the Philippines might net, you know, a dollar fifty. So, um, but those are pretty long form surveys. So it really depends. If you're doing like a short form survey, someone like Polefish will usually pay out like maybe thirty cents. You know, yeah. so if we're paying out. You know, if we're paying out like 15 cents, maybe we cover, you know, a 15%, a 15 cent margin. Got it. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Yep. And then on the topic of staking, which you also mentioned briefly earlier, a user had asked, um, Instar is one of the most profitable staking um, options in crypto space today. Can you explain more about your staking, the minimum and maximum requirement, and APR, as well as incentives to stake rather than hold? Yeah. I'm not quite sure about his claim, whether or not it's one of the, quote, most profitable staking models. I don't, I don't know where it stands in the market, uh, but the numbers that it does yield is you get 3.23% in-star tokens um, yearly. Uh, based on your stake, but it's paid out every 24 hours automatically by the smart contract. So, you know, we're not sending people payments. You're not waiting for your payment. It's literally every day, I think at uh, midnight, um, Greenwich time. Uh, so whatever you have staked, you're basically getting 3.23% per year on that divided by 365. So each daily reward is whatever that number comes out to be. The incentives and reasons to stake is more, you know, this, it's participating in the network. So EOS, uh, IO software, which is what the Instar blockchain is majority based off of, uh, is a delegated proof of stake blockchain. So what that means is there's accounts. It's not just public key, private key. So you have a unique account that is attached to your public key. And then that account, in order to do different things in the blockchain, requires CPU and network resources. And so if I want to, let's say, uh, make another account, I need to stake tokens on behalf of that other account to give it ne enough network resources to get started. If I want to deploy a um, weather data application onto Instar blockchain, I'm going to need to have Instar tokens staked 
and delegate them CPU and uh, RAM in order to have enough uh, computing power to run a smart contract on the blockchain. So the token utility really comes down to, um, you know, what use you want to have. If you want to deploy a, a DAP, it's, you want more tokens to have more CPU and RAM. Mm -hmm. um, and then also voting for the block producers because, you know, the network security comes down to them. And so you want to be participating in the network, knowing who is powering the resources that you're deploying um, and where that sort of trust is in, you know, who's running a decentralized community, which is cool about EOSIO software because you do have a better idea of who's actually powering the network. You know, with Bitcoin or Ethereum, we really don't know, to be honest. You know, you, you hear like the big names, um, but you, no one really actually, you know, knows who's behind the companies or, you know, um, if they're associated with each other or not. So it's easier to sort of keep track of who's running the blockchain. Um, so I think those are the key reasons to stake. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And then the last two questions we have from our community are in regards to building out the um, Instar ecosystem and just how people can get more involved. So one user had asked, how can they individually assist with development, research, and marketing of the profit of the project? Excuse me. What? How would they benefit from that? So I think one really cool initiative that we're launching uh, is Instar Researchers. So we're looking for more people to create surveys and try to collect industry feedback and data that is useful. So if you write into um, info at insights.network and say, you know, market researcher uh, request, we want to get more of the community involved in the creation of surveys. And so we have an in-star token budget from the community tokens fund, which we're going to um, release to people who, you know, apply and, you know, fit the criteria we're looking for. You don't need to have much experience or be an industry expert. Um, so please reach out if you want to get involved. But yeah, we want to have more people creating more surveys um, and getting useful feedback about the industry because we have a lot of cryptocurrency users on Instars. So getting their rapid feedback about what, where they think the market's going, you know, what new projects that they're you know, attracted to and you know, why they believe or don't believe in the new DeFi craze. You know, things like that are useful. And so we want to start extracting more of that information and then publicly sharing it with the crypto community. And the way they benefit is they get tokens. Got it. Okay, thanks. And then on um, a more macro scale, um, so in the crypto community, one of the largest ways to drop adoption are around like marketing and building um, strong communities around it, right? So how does Insight Network What's Insight Network's plan for this? Um, a user had reached out stating that they're a bit concerned considering um, the community size is relatively small compared to comparables. And so how do you guys intend on marketing the project further? Yeah, there's a lot of local Instar communities forming. So like if you're an Instar, if you're a Philippines user, we have now have admins that are assigned to Instar Philippines. And so if you look around Twitter and you say you are from the Philippines and you want to get more involved with the local community, you can find them on Twitter. Uh, and so these are just people from the Instar community. Um, and, you know, the community is bigger than socials. You know, we have, I think, over 200,000 KYC verified wallets taking surveys now. Um, but not everyone likes to chat on Telegram. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, you know, there's people on the tell, there's a good, we have a good telegram channel. We have a Twitter, uh, we post a lot on our own blog. Now we used to be on medium, but blog.instars.com. Um, but in terms of attracting more people to take surveys, um, outside of just the mainline crypto networks is we want to get the local communities more involved. So Instar Philippines is exciting. You know, they're doing great work down there. Um, the Netherlands is growing in Star Amsterdam. One of our block producers is two of our block producers are from Amsterdam. Um, so they contribute a lot to the project. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, those are all the questions we have from the Bitrix Global community. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today and answering questions um, from our users and the larger crypto community as well. 
And then for those that are tuning in, you can learn more about Instar at um, about.instars.com. And so, Brian, thank you again so much for joining. And then for everyone that's tuning in, we all thank you, Rawa. Thanks to Rawa and Bitrex Global. All you guys are great. Appreciate it. Talk soon. All right. Thank you.